Here's our scripture for today for you to read and concentrate it. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who wa- makes the Lord his trust. Everyone say trust. It's different than faith. Faith, we're believing, we're more active. Trust, more settled and confident. Okay? And does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. And today we've got a whole world full of liars that we need to pray for. People that will not tell you the truth, that are withholding things from us. All right, you ready to get in the word? I have some things that I want to start doing now in our, in our services. And before the word, I want to give you a word, okay? And it's kind of like a, um, a supplementary thought, okay? First thing, how many remember the story of the ten virgins? Yeah. Amen? All right. It's a story of us as believers, It's a type and shadow of those, and here's what I want to bring out. As I was praying yesterday and this morning, God says, let me show you what I want to mean with that. So how many here know what oil represents? We are told in in Bible college that the oil, I'm going to quote it for you in a minute, that they contained is really the presence of God. So it says there were ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish, and the wise ones took oil oil and extra oil. I'm just going to keep it simple. And the unwise just existed on what they knew or what they had. So there are many Christians today are just existing on what they have. But God wants us to be with him so he can fill ourselves with his presence and his oil and fill us. I have what we call an oil bank. I'm in the presence so much that I want it not only to pour out out of me, but pour into the oil bank when I need it. Are you following what I'm saying? And is there such a thing like that? Yes, there are, because the virgins, remember, they took and filled, got all their oil and extra oil. Now, I'm going to tell you, Christians that don't have a prayer life, Christians that don't dwell long enough with God, don't get enough of the presence and the power of God in them. So that when they're lo- what they're looking for and what they want to go after, they fall short. So what do they do? They go to the ones that's got all the oil, Dave. And when I, also, when I mention your name, doesn't mean I'm trying to put you on the spot. You're out of oil or something. No, I mentioned it because I want you to feel a part of what I'm doing here. So if I ever mention your name, Zach, <laughs> you're blessed, okay? It has nothing to do with putting you on the spot. So... They had to get the oil. So the ones who didn't spend the time with God had their salvation and had the spirit, but they didn't have the sustaining presence of God for our journey. What's our journey? That's our life. And when the Lord comes, would you be able to enter in? Do you know the only reason we go to heaven? Can anybody tell me? It's because we have who in our heart? That's the only reason we go to heaven. And if he's in our heart, then the Bible says that God accepts us as if we were him. How many sins did Jesus die for? All past, present, and... So remember something. I'm going to say this. Somebody is really getting this. Okay. Remember, we don't follow God here. Lean not to your own understanding. Okay? We follow God here. That means you need to slow down a bit when it comes with God and let him get to you the presence and the power and the anointing operating in that day for you. You see, I meet with God every day so I can tank up. You plug your cell phone in every day so that you have a charge. That's how it works. You don't meet with God first, you're not putting him first. People say, oh, I love God. How Then how much do you walk with him? That old song says, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My home is up there, way beyond the blue. All right? So I'm living for heaven. I'm living for God, but I'm letting God live through me. That's the key. How many here know that you want to do things to please God? But how many here have ever found yourself falling short 
you, you forgot is God helps us to keep our ability to stay with him. We can't do it on our own. If we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. All right, so that's a little keep yourself full of the presence of God as much as you can because that's what sustains us and keeps us balanced. Can you say amen? Now, another thing is Christians. The greatest temptations the enemy uses against us is fault finding. Please, it is so easy to fault find. I know with myself, I know my faults. I think I know all of them, but I don't. How many know that God doesn't fault find you? So if our Father doesn't fault find us, and He already knows what our situation is, why do we fault find others? Why behold the, the speck that's in your brother's eye when, behold, you got a plank in your own? First, remove the planks. Remove your life with God. Let him fix you up really good before you start criticizing everybody else. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to say anything bad against you. <laughs> so fault finding. Satan uses it because as a man judges another man, so the judgment comes back. So let's, let's practice those things. Get in the presence of God. Get tanked up and get some extra. Can you say amen? The extra pops off as joy and peace and long-suffering and goodness and gentleness and, and peacefulness. Nothing like the peace of God to guide us. Can you say amen? And who is our peace? God himself. Amen. So don't pursue peace as an it. Pursue peace as the Lord. All right. So, I, so do I have anything else? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's it. So good, good morning, everybody. My dad said to me a long time ago, he says, you got one gift I can acknowledge. And I said, what's that, dad? He says, a gift to gab. <laughs> All right. So here we're going to gather together and welcome to the briefing. It's very interesting that Linda and I missed you all. We really did. We pray for you every day, and that's not a credit. We're not trying to, because we love you. We, we appreciate you. We know that prayers for one another causes us to make up the difference when we fall short. Amen? All right. Folks, we've never been born at a time such as this. Have you noticed that God purposed you to be born in this time, in this place? Hello? And for what reason? Think, for what reason? For you to be a witness, to bring light into the darkness, to project Jesus into people's lives by the love and grace of God. Amen. Sometimes we carry water into the desert. It's, it might be that we don't like the desert, but you know what? The desert needs water. And sometimes we have to share to people that might not appreciate what we're doing, but if you do it with love, they'll appreciate later the water and the seed that you gave them to function on. Can you say amen? God wants us to make a difference. We're, I'm not here on this planet anymore for myself. God supplies all of my need. I don't worry about what I'm going to eat. I'm serious. And I didn't t start off this way. I don't worry what I'm going to put on. I'm not even concerned about my bills. Why? Because God seems, is if I keep my relationship with him the way I, I'm supposed to with his help, he takes care of all of my needs. Now, can I see the hands of those that have the same results? Put your hands up high. I want it on camera. You mean God does that for you too? You must be no respecter of persons. Now, one thing you need to understand is there's a lot of religious teaching in the body of Christ. For example, you never know what God's going to do. He could be leading through you through this and through that to teach you something. Oh, God is allowing this in your life. To How many know that that is not even scriptural? Yet we embrace it as truth because it's religious. It sounds good. Here's another problem. We flop from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I, I believe in the whole Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? So in the Old Testament, they didn't have God in them. They were pursuing and believing for a coming Messiah. In the New Testament, who lives in us? So why would God send himself through the wilderness unless you're going to bring the good stuff to whoever's, whoever's dry? So circumstances of life are designed to take away from you your relationship of God. And if they're negative, we know where it comes from. 
And if they're positive, we know who to thank. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven. What kind of gift? Good. So if you're experiencing things that are not good, go to God and he'll help you straighten it out. And if they're not perfect, hey, God says that his dealings with us are perfect in every way. Is God perfect, folks? So everything he does is perfect. So concerning you, he's going to deal with you in a perfect way. So we need to stop figuring out how God's going to deal with us and relax, trust him, and allow God to deal with them. Somebody say amen. Take your Bible and go with me to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Look at the two verses, verse 1 and 2. We're going to call this sermon today, The Race Set Before You. The Race Set Before You. Everybody has a race to run. Everybody has a life to live. I cannot live your life for you, and you cannot live your life for me. We are to live our life to God. When we live our life to God, he takes our life and he makes it into something beautiful. For he is the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the Father. Why? To help us get there too. Didn't he tell the people in the boat? All right, disciples, go to the other side. Right? What did he say? Folks, you're going to the other side. Hell or high water is not going to keep you from doing it because you love Jesus. You love the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He lives in you now. Okay? So let me just share something with you. In the Old Testament, God was not in their boat. We see the first uh, ex example of Jesus praying and saying, go to the other side. So they get in the boat. Jesus is still praying, right? What happens? The storm comes, and then they see Jesus walking on the water. That's a symbol of the Old Testament. God walked towards them, worked with them, but was not in their boat. But in the New Testament, the other time is, he got in the boat with them, and they went, they were going to the other side, right? Folks, many Christians today got their eyes on the storms and not on who's in your boat. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. We need to focus in the God inside of us, not the God someday will show up. Satan's a master at disguising truth and making it really not so truthful. Is God living in your heart? Is he going to let you drown? That was Michael. <laughs> That's all right, Mike. Amen. That's one grace. That's one. <laughs> Amen. You're blessed. All right, so let's read the scripture. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Now, listen, if you're used to most churches not putting any down, you only get a 20-minute sermon. Not enough to even tickle your nose. You need something that you can bite and chew on when you leave here. Amen. So let's go through this. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, Therefore... What was the chapter before 12? Scott will give this one. 11. What's it about? All the people's testimonies that went on before us, correct? So let's, re don't forget that part. Now listen. Therefore, because of that, we also sense we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside. Let who? Let us lay aside. Now, Think about it. All that I've shared with you as a congregation, except for all the new ones, I, sh I share with you that when we go in to meet with God, what is the thing that we need to lay aside? Our flesh. Amen. It says, you present your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12. You, the spirit man, present your body, your earth suit. Your earth suit. It gives you problems all the time. And you lay it on the altar so God can zap it. Here it is again. Look at what it says. Lay aside every weight and sin. Now, isn't it funny? Let me ask you. When I say weight, do you think all of a sudden, yeah, I am overweight. Where's your eyes? There you go. See how tricky the enemy is? So 
It says, lay aside every weight. What that really means is everything in your life that is wasting your time, where it's not causing you to get anywhere. I'm not talking about fun, like golfing or fishing or hunting. What I'm talking about is those things that you're involved in that seem to waste your time. You never can get anything done, or you're never on time because of it. Everyone say, wait. Lay aside the weight. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, you cannot lay the side of your weight without Christ helping you. Because what will happen after you lay it aside, maybe you'll go a day or two and you'll pick it back up again. <laughs> All right? So lay aside the weight and what? Sin. Sin simply means stop missing the mark. We, th we think sin is adultery and fornication, but sin simply means not hitting the bullseye and whatever you miss is causing great problems. So lay aside the weight and the sin that so, thank you, Usher, I appreciate that. <laughs> and it so easily besets you, okay, and run with what? Endurance or patience, if you have a translation like that. The what that's set before you? The race that's set before you. Run with patience the race set before you. Now, we know in James, about the second verse, it says, let patience have her perfect work so that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. We know that patience is not an it. Patience is a who. And who are we talking about? We're talking about God being inside of you. So let's read it with the vernacular. Now, remember the book of Hebrews was written to Jews who did not believe in the Messiah. And here the author is trying to convince them that Jesus Christ is more important than any other thing, than the priesthood, than, the, than this, than the altar, than the temple. It, it, Jesus is it. When God spoke to um, his son and Peter, James, and John was there, he says, this is my son. Pay attention to him. Jesus is our shepherd. We need to keep focused on him. Why? Because he will never let you stumble if you're focused on him and you allow his word to be the light for your feet, a lamp to your path. Are you with me? All right. So I realize I'm throwing a lot of scriptures out, but I want you to know that God has a plan for you that's so perfect, so perfect, we fall a lot short because we don't quite understand it. That's the purpose of church, to give you a word that you can take with you, a package that you can unwrap that will become the living word inside of you. Amen? All right. In this so being, it says, I love this, and it says, therefore, since we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, those are our, our relatives have gone on, the people of the Old Testament that's gone on into heaven, they get to look down and see what you're doing once in a while. Amen. Go, piggy, go. Amen. Amen. All right. Got there for you, you see. You know, and then if you're carnal, you're thinking, I hope they don't see what I'm doing secretly. <laughs> there you go, thinking about yourself again. Everybody does that, Bunky. Amen. We all have secret things we need to deal with God about. But don't condemn yourself or let the enemy condemn you. Don't keep on doing it either. <laughs> Get yourself changed because the way you look at things will control the way you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, he becomes. So if you think you can't be saved, you're never going to sit down long enough to be saved. If you think you can't be delivered, you never will be able to get delivered. If you think this is the way you are and you're going to be that way all your life, you are deceived and you are literally being guided by the wrong spirit. Hello. God has a plan for every human being that's ever been born. The, the fact that we don't see a lot of people being saved. Do you believe everybody want, God wants everybody saved? Why isn't everybody saved? Either they don't know to choose him, they, they misplace God with religion, or they just don't know they could be. Because they don't pay attention, they don't listen. We're listening to all that crust that all this junk is programming out there. These are words of the enemy. It creates confusion. What's good is evil, and what's evil is good. Hello? If you don't believe me, turn on the news sometime. And see if you can't get a straight answer or the news. So moving past that, 
It says, let us lay aside every wheat, sin that ensnares us, let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us, looking unto who? All right, write this scripture down. We haven't got time to quote it, but it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. You can look it up later on. It tells you if you'll learn to focus on Christ, he'll change you into him. He'll change you into the same image from glory to glory. All right, so just write that address down if you can. All right, so then it says, okay, and then it says, looking unto Jesus who is the author, the beginner, and the finisher of our what? Faith. Faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. Now let's put that in our perspective. What's the joy before you? God. When you're focused on him, he gives you the energy to be stable and to sustain things of this earth. He doesn't expect you to walk through this earth by yourself. He expects you to walk through this earth for the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. But because man has misrepresented God, religiously talked about God, people don't know how to trust God. Take a look around you. You mention God and they almost laugh at you. That's because the church has misrepresented God. We need to represent the God of the Bible, not the God of our denomination. Now, I'm not against denominations. I'm not against any of that. We, we want to know the truth. What did Jesus say about the truth? We shall know the truth and what? <laughs> that truth will set you free. Now, if you're given a lie, what will it do? It will keep you in bondage. Not Satan's a master twisting the word just a little bit so that you can't believe in your heavenly father who loves you so dearly that he would send his son to die in your place and then raise him from the dead. Let's move right on. And it says... He's the author and the finisher of your faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. See, that's the earth. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God? For you. He's making intercession for you. Because we don't really know how to pray for ourselves very much. We're not all good at all that stuff. But he's saying, go get him. I'm praying for you. So there's a package that's absolutely perfect. And you have every access and every right to access that package and unwrap that package and understand who you are in Christ. You're a new species of being. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You've never existed like this before. And today's the first day of the rest of your life. How many years heard that one before? That's the way you live. Today is the first day. Yesterday is gone. Stop thinking back all the time. If I could, I should, I would. And so Satan gets you to look back. How many here can drive your car through the river, I mean, backwards through the rear view mirror? You know? That's exactly where many Christians, Satan's got them. Because they're looking back all the time, comparing notes with their past life instead of letting God give them hope, give them faith, that bellow his presence in you to work in such a way to lift you above your physical circumstances. Remember, we serve a very powerful God. He parted the Red Sea. He stood the Jordan up, not once but twice, and it stood up so far that the people in Jericho freaked out. And we're coming for you, Satan. Most people would never dare say something like that because they think they have to deal with them themselves. Listen, let God lead your life, and when Satan gets in the way, Jesus destroys him out of your way. But when you're in front of Jesus, he sees you. Oh, I know Carrie. I programmed him since he was a little boy. I put the fears in him. I put this, I got him to think about that, and this. And so he leaves the little seeds in there, and then we get saved. And everything seems to be good for about a month or so, and then all of a sudden he hits one of those seeds. Suddenly you think about this and think about that. Aren't you learning how the game goes? It's all a game there, not God's game. God's got you. But if you're listening to the crap giver, I'm not talking, you know, somebody throws the dice. It's just like... 
Las Vegas and Reno. You go in, life becomes a gamble without God. And some people go, well, why did that dear person suffer such things? Because life is a gamble without God. But they said they had the Lord. Don't forget. Get your oil full and get some extra. Hello, there's plenty to go around. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the wilderness are those who have gone, are, excuse me, the witnesses are those who have gone on to heaven as our own relatives, right? They're watching periodically, so watch what you do. Two, they are allowed, we are allowed the grace of watching each other. So we got these surroundings of all these witnesses. How many know that it's what you do will erase what you say? Or it will, it will witness what you say. How many here has ever heard people brag, 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 but what they do is not even close to what they say? Please don't be that way. Say amen. Don't brag at all. Matter of fact, it's pride and God hates pride, but gives grace to the humble. Third thing is the key to finish our, our life, our race, is knowing the author and the finisher of our faith and focusing in on him. A good athlete does what? Like if he's going to go on a race, what's some of the things he does? He trains. He listens to his coach. The coach can tell him, this is how you should be striding. This is how you should be doing it. Now, you get some kid who thinks they know everything, most kids, will say, hey, coach, I know better than you. And that's what we do to God sometimes. God is perfect, and he's thinking all about how he can get you to have a wonderful life. But you won't listen. Now, I'm not saying you guys, but sometimes we don't listen. So I want you to catch this. So a good athlete is focused on the event to finish it with honor and receive the prize, right? Through good training and encouragement by the coach, the Holy Spirit, that's what the word comforter means. It's also one of the words be coach. Let the Holy Spirit coach you. Okay, all right. He says, good training and encouragement by the coach given to us and with his help helping us, we become champions. How many's ever heard me tell you, hi, champion. Good to see you, champion. What? Amen. I believe you're champions. God believes you're champions too, if you will listen to him. And remember, even if we're not able to quite do what he asks, he's right there to help us to do it. So you're not doing it alone. You're not doing it in your own power. It's not your own works of righteousness, but according to his working in you. Let him out. Let him fill your words with encouragement. Let him fill your mind with good thoughts. Let him steal the enemy in your presence. And then finally, here's a question. If anyone, a who or what, who are we competing against? If we're running a race, we're in competition to somebody, aren't we? Well, the world says you're in competition to everyone. He with the most toys wins, you know. But the Bible says we're in competition not with others. Because in Corinthians it says if you compare yourself amongst yourself, you're a fool. Well, I want to be like Pastor Kerry. Please, there's only one of me and my wife wouldn't appreciate that. <laughs> You, you see what I mean? So Satan has all of these little quirks he throws out our way. No, what we do is we compare ourselves with Jesus, and when we fall short, he's right there to lift us up. We compete against ourselves. That's who we compete against. We're competing against our flesh, which only does things for itself. What are we to do with our flesh, dear Christian? Huh? Crucify it. That's why that's in there. So you go to God, you say, Lord, I take out my flesh, crucified for the day. See, you can't get your flesh crucified once and once and for all. That's a false teaching. You have to crucify yourself daily. You got another scripture? Well, I've got dozens of them for that. But Jesus said, if you choose to really want to come after me, how many here really want to come after Jesus? Everybody raise your hand. 
I want the devil to see this. We want to come after Jesus. First thing he says, you have to deny yourself. Oh, and we get this weird idea. Deny myself of what? Of yourself. Deny yourself of yourself because yourself is a monster. You don't believe me? Wait till you get angry and you almost do something you wish you never did. It's a monster without God. It has to be subjected to God, pulverized, and zapped so it could behave itself. My flesh is my servant, not my king. People who are addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, they've let their flesh make that thing and their flesh king over God. And you know what? God loves them. God loves the person that's bound. But unless we get the word in them, their head is always going to talk himself out of stuff. You've got to learn to listen. Didn't Jesus say those with ears? Let them hear what, we had a whole bunch of people there, Scott, had no ears? <laughs> because listening is an art. I'm going to say that again. Listening is an art. Hey, everybody. Listening is an art. Why are you whispering, Pastor Kerry? Because I know a whole entire church. I won't tell you what color. I, preach, I preached all over, so... In this one particular church, I noticed everybody in the church yelled. And they, and they were all a big bunch of noise. And I said, Lord, how are they going to listen to my small voice? How are they going to hear that? He says, I want you to whisper your sermon. And when I whispered gently, everybody slid up on the front of the pew to hear what I had to say. People were healed because they lost the ability to listen to the noise of the world. I'm not talking about physically here now, you know. I'm talking about spiritually. You get whacked by a few Christians who are carnal, who don't respect you, and sometimes that can shut your hearing off. Peter in the garden, when Malchus came forward to take Jesus, Peter pulled the sword and he did what? He went for Malchus' head, but he missed, got his ear. What did Jesus do? Jesus, those, he knew he needed his ear to do what? How about your ears? And I'm not talking about physical. How well do you listen to God? I mean, take a note, not to pick on you. Because if you will listen well, faith comes by hearing and the ability to hear by the word of God. Since so faith comes by hearing and your ability to hear or your hearing develops by the word of God. You see? God says he brings us forth by his word. Amen. So if we don't got no word in us, he can't bring you forth by your mind because you could be a big, big screwball. <laughs> Laugh at me, will you? Laugh with me. All right, go with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Wow. In verse 24 and 25, it's a reality. Amen. It's really important. You pick up along the way the word of God. Say amen. So you're running a relay race. Your job is to hit the spots God laid out for your life. That's your job. You're not running against others. You're running against yourself that resists you from following God. So you crucify it and you go after the goals that God set before you because his will is for you in certain ways and for Joe in a certain way and for Carrie in a certain way. Our job is to run that race and pick up the things he wants us to understand, touch the lives he wants us to touch and go along the way and enjoy God. Amen. And then on top of it, he gives us a lot of time for ourselves, so we can Kick back, relax, and not be so stressed. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a garden. Amen. Yet I see so many stressed out Christians because they're working hard for God and they're so far ahead of God. And God's saying, Look, come on back. Come on, I didn't tell you to do that. And that's why you're having such a tough time. Moving right along. So listen to the scripture. Do you not know that those who run in a race, your life, 
All run, but one receives the prize. Who's going to, which one of you, there's two of you, which, can you tell me what they are? Your flesh and you. It says there's two of you all over the Bible. There's two of you. And no one says, well, which one's getting bigger? The one you feed the most. If you're feeding yourself into sin and feeding yourself the things you shouldn't, you don't lose your salvation. You're a God's son now. But you're sure going to grow up with a carnal blob. Hello. Or if you keep laying that down and letting God, you feed your spirit, you're going to grow up into a Charles Atlas and you'll move mountains by the word of God. Why? Because it's God in you doing the work. Not you. Are you with me? I haven't lost you yet. Okay, do, not, do you not know those that run a race all run and once receives a prize? Run in such a way. Everyone say such a way. That I, you may obtain it. How many know that God wants you to get what he has given you? But you have to run in a way you can do it. You can't just do your own thing and expect God to bless everything that you do. You have to do according to his way. And it's easy if you have him help you. Are you with me? And if anyone who competes for the prize is tempered or balanced in all things. Now they do not, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable. Did you know that God has rewards for all of you? There's a, uh, a salvation reward. There's a faith reward. There's a reward for the works that you do because it's God doing the work in you. And so if you do kind things for people, it says that even if you give a glass of water in the name of the Lord, out of love, you will never lose your reward. And when you get there, you're going to find out the first thing Christ, your old thoughts and old past is going to burn off you. Now you have to be born again. And then everything that you've done or not done is going to reflect right there. And you're going to see you coulda, you shoulda, but God's going to wipe those tears away. And you're going to see the rewards of the things that you actually got done. You're in a relay race. You're running against your flesh and overcoming. Can you say amen? You're not running against the flesh of others. You're not running against this. Hello? You're not in competition with the devil. Have you ever read the news? Satan lost over 2,000 years ago. Well, why are they so busy in my life? Because you don't know the word yet. And please, stop blaming God. Let's get you the word. Man, you should be going out and finding out. If people like me, there's plenty of good pastors like myself will give you the word. But make sure you got a good one. Not somebody who will give you step-by-step step of psychology and say, now you go out there and try to be good. And that's not good. Because then it's our effort, not God's effort in us. Then who gets the glory if it's our effort? We do. And God won't share the glory with anybody. But if you let God inspire you to do things, then God, God gets the glory and you get the reward. Hello? Does your horses push your cart or do they pull it? Boy, this is good. I want you to all enjoy this. No. <laughs> what is it? It's deep. I'm trying to get you to lighten up a little bit. Because we have a tendency sometimes to see how we focus. You know, I'm not doing so good. Maybe I need some help. Great. Now you're in a place of getting it. If you can admit you need God, wonderful are you. But if you think you can do it on your own, you're going to have some tough times. All right, moving past. When we are born again, we start our race. Everyone has a race to run. Two, we compete, we compete against our flesh, not others. Say amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Thirdly, we are to run in such a way that we may obtain what God has promised us. Fourthly, to everyone who competes, we have to be balanced. How many know that an excess of anything is not too good? 
Happy is a man that does not condemn himself in that which he allows. It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of a man. So if you like to drink beer, I'm not condoning it, but stop at one. If you get to three or four or five, now you're going to be an idiot, and what comes out of you, God's going to hold you account to. That's why the drugs and the alcohol was designed to change your mind and put you under a pharmacia spirit where you're not yourself. And when we look at somebody and say, I think you're you. <laughs> Hello. In fact, the Bible does not condone drinking. Jesus was not a, a sipper of wine. He was a Nazarene. Nazarenes cannot touch wine, nor do they cut their hair. So you see little pictures of Jesus with a short haircut? Not the wine. I know. I've seen him. I've seen him with 30 people, all of us together. He looks kind of like that a little better, though. <laughs> he looks, he's blue-eyed. You can see through him. He has nice, bound, silvery, goldish hair. And now it glows like fire and his feet are like brass. But when I saw him, he was calling me to him. Why did God appear to you, Pastor? I have no idea I'm going to ask him that. But does not make me any more special than any of you? Remember that. Comparing is wrong. But God, for some reason, chose me. That's the way he did. And you know what? I'm just going to be one of those people that are just going to obey him. Praise God. How about you? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go on. Now, let's drop down 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 26 and 27. Therefore, I run thus. This is how I run. This is how I walk with God. Not with uncertainty. Many Christians today are uncertain in their walks. They think they're going to lose their salvation. Or this is going to happen. This kind. You're believing for the negative. Stop that. Neither do we run with uncertainty. Thus, Paul says, I fight. Not as one who beats the air. Now, what is he saying about that? Someone that shadow boxes. What do they do? They're beating the air, right? Now, who walks about as... Not as, but almost as a roaring lion. Satan. Satan does. It's a shadow. It's a threat. I'm going to get you. And then Paul says, when I deal with him in my life, I'm not like somebody just whacking at everything, throwing out words, just being crazy. No, I know calculated to release God on Satan and not try to beat him with my own hands. Hello. Look at how he wraps this up through it. He says this. Now, he says this, okay? He says, lest at any time I preach to others, I myself be rejected or as a castaway. Now, I'm not asking you to remember, but how many Christians have you met that, that made a mistake? Maybe they fell. Maybe some part of their life got broken. And how the Satan is right there. He's right there saying, yep, see, this is the way it's going to be. You'll never be able to get up, become a champion. Now, does God throw us away? Even when we sin willfully, he does not throw us away. Can you tell me why? In the Old Testament, God opened up ground and swallowed people. But in the New Testament, can you tell me why God doesn't do that with us? Number one, because we're his kids. And God is not a kid abuser. So stop letting people say, Oh, God's leading me through the mud and the crud. You'll say, No, because you don't know the word. So let's get you to a place where you can read, or let me read the word to you. Because that's what Satan does. He gets us out of the heart into the head, and now we're in trouble. Doesn't say that your head doesn't smart, and you don't have good things in there. But you've got also a bunch of other junk, kind of clatters about. Just go ahead and shake it real good, you know. All right. Okay. And then finally, every human being has a race to run. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 through 8. Keep you for another five, six minutes, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. Paul says, all dealing with the race. What is our race? Our life. What are we running? Are we running Dave's life? No, we're running our life. And who's help guiding our life? Who's help setting the goals in our life? Amen. Should we run out in front of God? Should we lag way behind? Sometimes we do, but God won't condemn that. But when we get out in front of God, 
God is our protection. So if we're out in front of them, where are those arrows going to hit that the enemy flings at us? Right in the, right, boom. For in him we live, move, and have our being. The Bible says that we're in Christ. We're in this building. We're not out in the parking lot. We're in Christ. Where are we? We're in Christ, hidden in God. So guess what? Satan has to call you out of God so you get your ugly muggly out there and then he pulverizes you because you're out there where he can hit. But the Bible says we're hidden in the cleft of the rock. He says we're hidden in God. Hidden from what? The enemy. Did you know when you go into your prayer closet and you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Satan cannot see you anymore. He can't hear what you're praying in your prayer closet. It's only when you come out and start bragging, oh, I've got my up, I'm believing for this. Satan says, aha, let's just work against that. And people who don't know any better, oh, God's going to give us a vision. And we're going to go into paradise and we're going to do this and we're going to die for all that. I used to believe something like that. Something, if God really told you that, it will happen. It's not a pipe dream like a carrot hanging off some donkey's nose. That's Satan. One day I'm going to give you the calling and the desire of your heart. One day, that's the devil doing that. Remember the voice that goes through your head? God's voice is what? Perfect. The voice goes through your head. If it's absolutely full of wisdom and perfect, then you can ask probably God's voice. Now, if you hear your own voice and it's telling you you're a jerk, you're a dummy, whose voice is that? Satan. Satan's using your voice to tell you you're stupid. Would God ever tell you that? Even if you are, he would never tell you that. So you got to discern what's coming through your head because that's half the problem. Moving right along. Thank God he moved right along. Listen to this. Therefore, okay, he doesn't fight with uncertainty. Now look at this. Let's go down to Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul speaking again about the race, his life. Paul was, did Paul get persecuted? Oh, 2 Corinthians 11. It says the perils of Pauline. Shipwrecked, beat, bum, 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 you know, whip three times and blah, 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 blah. So in the next, he says this. Now listen what it says. But none of these things move me. Get it? Because we're not living in the flesh. We're living in the spirit. Can Satan take your salvation from you? He cannot. Neither can you lose your salvation, even if you dropped it. But you can give it away. To, you can give it back to God. And of course, none of you are that without wisdom. Can you say amen? So these people say, yeah, you got to be careful with that. Once saved, always saved. They don't even know what they're talking about. I always ask those people, what are you talking about? They can't even describe it. People will say anything. I'm against this. I'm de- I don't like that doctrine. I don't want to go to that church because they do this. Stop that. What if God wants you to go there? Don't resist him. All right, moving on. (laughs) But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. You get it? Here's the key. Don't make yourself your own best friend. I'm my own best friend. Hello. So that I may finish my race. You get it? Of course you do. I'm just saying these are very important points, okay? Race, finish the race with what? Finish the race with joy. Jesus for the joy that was set before him. Finish your life with joy. Why grow old and sour and crabby? Now, Dave, don't you look at me that way. (laughs) Really, we should be wiser, softer, more loving, we should be more understanding, less hard, because God has been with us all length of time, giving us that holy marinade. He's marinating your meat. And some of us, he has to dig down. I was over in Montana, and Sue has this little instrument that she 
It's kind of mint, meat tenderish, and it pushes all those little needles in there like that. Well, God's not going to meat tenderize you, but he is going to marinate you in his presence. But listen, you have to sit there long enough for him to get busy on you. We sit, we, we tell them what we need, we, we, we tell them how good he is, and it just becomes a little thing like that, but we never let his presence settle down and dig out and replace some of those old fears and frustrations that we have hidden so far inside of us. It says the light will go into the darkness and reveal what needs to be fixed. Not condemn those who are unfixable. All right, right on again, listen to this. None of these things move me now. Down to 2 Timothy 4, please, and finishing. Boy, this guy is long-winded. I told you, my dad said I've got the gift to gab. Everything I've said is the word of God to you. How much did you retain? What spoke to you personally? Not convicted you, but what spoke to you personally? What things did I say it inspire you to get some more of God. I hope it does. My job is not to make you feel bad. The world will do that. Sometimes your wife, too. <laughs> or husband. Catch this. He says, I have fought the good fight of faith. Verse 7. I have finished the race. He was going up to Rome, remember, to be killed. He knew it. Everybody's telling, Paul, don't go. You're going to be killed. He says, I'd rather go and face the people I need to face and share the gospel and lose my life rather than to keep my life and have to be chewed out by God. Moving right along. I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, the day that we go to stand before the Lord. And not only to me, but also to those who love the Lord at his appearing. Folks, we're supposed to be watching for Jesus to show up. Amen? Gehazi was a servant of Elijah. And Gehazi was one of those realists. I see the problem. I see the problem. I see the problem. Christians, you're not to look at the problem because you'll never find a solution. And you're going to see the problem. There's all these armies out there. We're going to die, Elijah. Elijah says, Lord, lift his eyes up so they're not on the earth. They're on God. And as soon as Gehazi lifted up his eyes in 2 Kings, it says he saw the armies of the Lord. I want to say to you in this hour, Stop looking at the world. It's passing away, folks. If you've got a lot of investments there, make sure they're in God's hands. Hello? Stop looking at the world. Because the Bible says that we are to be heavenly minded. We're not to set our mind on things on this earth. But rather set our minds on God and the things in heaven. Higher realm. So when Gizehi lifted up his eyes, God opened his eyes and he saw they're more with us than they are with them. Did you know only one third of the angels that were operating in the earth fell with Lucifer? That means two thirds are still here. That means there are more with us than there are with him. But why do we see him running rapid through everything? Because people don't know the truth and you'll always be a, tr a slave until you know that you've been set free and how to maintain that freedom with God so that you can live a full life and that more abundantly. If you've got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a praise? <laughs> Amen.